Good morning and welcome to the Obliva KOL event. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentations. If you'd like to submit a question, you may do so by using the Q&A text box at the bottom of the webcast player. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and a replay will be made available on the Obliva website following the conclusion of the event. I'd now like to turn the call over to Ellen Donnelly, Chief Executive Officer of Obliva. Please go ahead, Ellen. Hi, I'd like to welcome you all to our event today to talk about treatments for the uh, therapies for the treatment of primary mitochondrial disease. As Tara mentioned, I'm the CEO of Obliva and I'm joined by my colleague, Magnus Hansen, who's our Chief Medical Officer. I'm also excited to be joined today by two experts in the field. I'd like to introduce later Dr. Amel Kara. She's a leading investigator in the area and a physician at MGH and a patient, Regina. We'll hear from both of them in a few minutes. As you know, Obliva is focused on making medicines for patients with primary mitochondrial disease. The team has over 30 years of working experience in mitochondrial dysfunction. And we are really proud of our programs because they address the underlying pathology of mitochondrial disease by going straight to the heart of the dysfunction. There are currently no approved therapies for mitochondrial disease. And so there's a large commercial opportunity for this fairly large rare disease of over 100,000 people in the US and Europe. Our lead asset, KL1333, is currently in a late stage clinical trial that is pivotal or registrational should the data look good. So that means that we can take it to the market if we have statistically significant evidence. And that's pretty exciting. Obliva has really been focused on optimizing our path to the market, as well as ensuring that the drug is protected and our commercial opportunity is large. And we've done that through advanced discussions with the regulata regulatory authorities, as well as good IP protection on the programs. Developing drugs is neither cheap nor easy. And so we look to all of the stakeholders around us for their expertise and guidance as we, as we develop this program. Really important to this program has been the input from patients, physicians, and the entire rare disease community. And we're thankful for all of their support and guidance. We also look to the regulators quite often with frequent meetings to understand their thoughts on our programs to ensure that it is ready and successful when it gets to the NDA submission process. Um, and the payer input is also very important to us. Payers are the healthcare providers that really evaluate our medicine and see how much they're going to charge for that when they sell it, when we sell it to the um, to the patients. And so payers have also provided input into this program. Specifically in the KL1333 program, we spend a lot of times with patients understanding their disease and the symptoms that they find most disabling. And from that discussion, found that fatigue and myopathy really rose to the top. Um, we also obviously looked at our mechanism of action and said, are these things that we can address? And then went to national, natural history data to understand the prevalence of fatigue and myopathy within the PMD patient population. With the regulators, we had discussion about our clinical study design, our primary endpoints, and got their buy-in so that if the study is successful, it will lead to regulatory approval. Um, and then with the payers, we wanted to make sure that they also liked the primary endpoints, that they thought fatigue was an important endpoint to look at, and they did confirm the potential for premium pricing in the area, which is obviously important to us to get back the money that we put into the program at the end. Um, so we're really excited about the potential for our programs to treat patients with primary mitochondrial disease. And we really look forward to today to give you a glimpse into the patient situation, the area from a physician's point of view. And then at the end of the day, Magnus will talk a little bit about KL1333 and our development program. So I'm happy now to introduce you to Dr. Amel Kara and our patient, Regina. Turning it over to you, Dr. Kara. Thank you, Alan and Magnus, and hi, everyone. Good morning. Regina, are you all set? I'm all set. Perfect. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Regina, my patient, who has been living with mitochondrial disease for a long time. Um, Regina has a mitochondrial DNA disorder, and um, today she's here to share her experience with us. So Regina, can you tell us um, how long have you been living with the, your mitochondrial disease? Um. I would say my, all my life I've had the mitochondria and um, to be aware and to be diagnosed, I would say it would be almost 20 years now. 
Okay. So what led you to go to the medic, to the doctors and to seek a diagnosis? What kind of symptoms were you experiencing 20 years ago? Well, there wasn't so much the symptoms that I had. Um, I had a brother who was diagnosed with the disease. And at that point, um, I was made aware that um, his all of his siblings had the gene. Mm -hmm. Okay. And looking at what he was dealing with and what I had experienced all my life, I realized I really should be checked for it because, you know, all my life I had been tired all the time. I couldn't do things other people did. I couldn't um, compete. I was very, I couldn't... Um, play sports because I just didn't have the energy and I I always wondered why they could do it and why I couldn't do it um, even when I had my children um, I felt the same way why am I having such a hard time taking care of these children when other people can do it with such ease so basically that's what's led me to the doctor. Okay. So you've did, once you got the diagnosis and you were told that you had the mitochondrial disease, looking back, you realized that all your life you've experienced symptoms that you couldn't explain, that nobody else pointed out to you that they were part of your mitochondrial disease. Aside from the fatigue and the tiredness, were there any other symptoms that you've experienced growing up and then later after you had your children? Uh, compared to other children, um, uh, I was definitely a loner. Um, I, um, whenever we had hearing tests at school, I was pointed out as having a problem with my hearing, which is one of the um, side effects of the mitochondria. Um, I also, growing up, watched my parents take care of my aunts and my cousins because they definitely had the mitochondria. And, um, but I didn't seem to have the se severity that they had. Um, other than that, um, no. You no, know, the tiredness, I slept a lot. Um, couldn't play sports. Um, one night, because I just didn't have the energy, I slept a lot. I was a very late sleeper. Um, and right. in recent years, Regina, you've had new symptoms develop. Can you tell us a little bit about those symptoms? About the new symptoms? Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay, that's tough one. I, I, I definitely had trouble walking. Now, I had been a walker all mm -hmm. my life. I'm walking to school, which was quite a distance and back. Um, my weekends, I just roam um, around the area and... Um, my walking got difficult. Um, and um, going up and down stairs, just doing the daily daily routine is tired. I mean, I'd get up, get my kids ready for school, and I'd be back in bed, mm -hmm. you know, because I'd be tired. That would tire me out. Then um, it eventually got to the point as I got older. Um, I'd get up, I'd, I'd, I'd have my, my breakfast, take a shower. By the time I get out of that shower, I'd be ready to go back to bed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you need another nap after your shower just because it takes out so much energy out of you. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, um, at this point in my life, it's gotten so bad. I need a walker. Um, I don't. Very slowly go anywhere without my walker. 
um, because I have to have something to hold on to, um, no matter what it is, whether it's walking around the room. I, mm -hmm. I before I even start, I'll say, okay, I can grab a hold of that bureau, then I can get the corner of that wall, then the bed, and then get to where I want to go. And um, yeah. Yeah, that was it. So yeah. I can test it. I can say that over the years, your balance has gotten worse. Your head oh. is now, as I see you, your head is shaking. Your speech is also different <laughs> because your muscle is also weaker in your in your throat. Um, and you've noticed that. At the end of the day, um, if I've cooked supper, which is not very seldom at this point, um, I have a hard time even holding my head up and standing up, up straight. Yeah. So it has gotten difficult. Um, and I remember you telling me that it has not just impacted you, but it has impacted your whole relationship with your family. Like you cannot spend time with your grandkids. You stopped working. Um, I did retire um, in 2012. And at that, at that point, I was having difficulty because I would get to work early um, so I could get the closest parking space and I would have trouble. I could not carry a cup of coffee from the car to the door. Mm -hmm. I, just, I couldn't do it. It would be all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess back, yeah, back then, I had problems. I also seem to, um, I used to like to golf. I couldn't golf anymore. I just didn't have the, the power, the swing, um, the balance, what, anything to do with that. Um, I used to love to swim. I became fearful of the water. Um, mm -hmm. if, stepping into a pool the farthest I would get is to the end of that pool where I could hold on to to get into the water. And then I would sit I would sit on the step. Whereas before I'd I'd swim a couple of laps. Um whatever it is. Um you, you were also telling me how you were apprehensive going out with your friends and your husband because you couldn't hear what they were saying very well. You were afraid to walk even side by side with them because you had to pay more attention. Your balance was off. <clears throat> okay, my balance was off a bit. I, I had to hold on to my husband um, for the longest time. I would walk. Everybody thought it was so sweet because they, they all, I always had my um hung around kids for balance and um, the hearing um, that's another thing I avoid going places um, because I, I can't hold a conversation with people because of my hearing I no matter what setting I have my hearing on I have a hard time and I don't know whether it's because of that but I have a lot, a uh, very soft voice, my husband says, and I have to speak up, speak up. Well, to me, I'm screaming, mm -hmm. you know, so it's got to be something connected right there. Yeah. Um, I do for a longer time, I, I, I avoided going out of the house, um, I avoided going to functions because I couldn't get up and walk around and socialize with people. Um, so they tended to avoid me. Um, and that's still a problem. Um, I, I think back growing up with my aunts and my, my cousins that passed away before me. And um, yeah, they, they would they had the same symptoms. Yeah. And they have since died from the mitochondria. So it it must be devastating to know that 
growing up your cousins had it and you saw, you saw their symptoms some of them passed away your mother your brother your children even have it how does it feel to know like this is lingering above your heads like so many family members affected by this disease it's heartbreaking it's it's heartbreaking to to watch them it's heartbreaking to watch them pass um and to watch how how they lost everything. I mean, at one point my brother had a feeling too. And I said, don't ever, ever do that to me. Um, there was something else I wanted to say and I can't, I can't think of it. Um, I, um, Okay. Okay. Oh, um, grandchildren. I have three daughters. I have three daughters and a son. My three daughters will never have children, and they know they'll never have children because they don't want to be brought into this world if they're not going to have any quality of life. And that's exactly what mitochondria is. It takes all your quality life away. Mm -hmm. um, so the only grandchildren I have are for my son. And I have two, have a little boy and a little girl, but they, don't, they won't let me take care of them. They won't let me spend time with them because they don't, because of my condition right now, and that's very heartbreaking to me and very depressing because, yeah. I mean, all I want to do is hold them and I can sit and talk with them and call with them, but they don't, they don't trust me That's mm -hmm. the because of the things I'm limited to. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you had, um, if you had a wish what would you want the community to know? Like, what would you want us to help with or fix in, in terms of your mitochondrial disease? What would, if you had everything you could have, what would your wish be for this mitochondrial disease? Um, to, find, to find a medicine, I know there's no cure, but to find a medicine that could help deal with the loss of quality of life. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, I was in that study with you mm -hmm. uh, where I went in for the infusions. I'll tell you, after that first infusion, I felt like Wonder Woman and it really scared me. It made me feel so good. However, after um, the week I spent in the hospital, and I was giving myself the injections. It couldn't have been as strong because I I felt great. My walking, even my kids would say, Mom, you're walking it so well. I didn't I could walk from getting something at a bar or a cup of coffee and I could actually walk to a table and sit down holding that table. Those are things I had I had lost. And I mean, just something, I mean, I think I took the shots myself for almost two years. Um, so what yeah. I'm hearing you say is that you want your, you want a, a medicine that helps with your quality of life. Like it would lessen the burden of the symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. If you can't find a cure, find a medicine that will help you deal with these um, deal with the loss of your quality of life, like your walking, uh, mm -hmm. your your hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing aids are wonderful, but they don't do the trick. Mm -hmm. They just don't. Um, yeah, you 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 need to find something uh, okay. to help with that. Um, and um, to be able to do things that on your own. Um, like I said, I can't, if I if plan on making um, 
uh, macaroni and cheese for supper. And I look at it and says, gee, I don't have any milk. I can't run up the store because I no longer drive. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to find something else. If my husband would go up and get it, that would be fine. But he's, he's older too at this point. But um, yeah, so it, it's um, it's made my those golden senior years are right there for me. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. you know, um, I try to uh, find um, things that I can do that I enjoy doing, and I I have found some crafts that I can do. It takes me a a lot longer, and um, everything, but. Um, it's even exercise, and exercise used to help me so much. And uh, I'm finding that difficult to do now, too, because of the uh, the strength and mm -hmm. the feeling. Um, the only, one thing I do, I take Reiki now. My problem with Reiki is Reiki is very expensive. Okay. And it helps me. It's made a little more energy. Okay. It helps you know, focus on things um, and to give me um, motivation. Okay. Yeah, all those things, it's amazing. But, so a drug that gives you more energy and more focus, heard loud and clear. Uh, thank you so much, Regina, for sharing your experience with me. Unfortunately, we don't have as much time to go deep into everything, but I appreciate so much you coming in today and sharing with us. And Eleanor, are there any questions for Regina? Uh, yes, there, there are a couple of questions uh, okay. that have come in. Um, so Regina, what, what do you currently uh, take to manage your symptoms? That's what one of the manage my symptoms? Um, I take a um, manage my symptoms. I take um, I take all my vitamins, the vitamin uh, mitochondria cocktail. I take um, I do chili yoga, and I do the mitochond I mean the uh, reiki, and I take um, uh, uh, clonazepam um, for my shakiness. That does help a lot. Um, and I take a medicine for my depression. I don't know the name of, name of it. I was on um, Zoloft and I, I had to switch because that was not strong enough. Um, and uh, I think those are the only two things. Oh, I do take um, a tenor, and I say tenor helps with um, seizures, although I have never had a seizure. So okay. I do, do take that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more last question. Do you, do you have a, a support network um, with friends or, or other pe people that you can share your experience and, and, and discuss the disease and its impact? Um, the only network I have right now is my father. My older brother has the same disease that I have right now, and, and he's probably suffering the same way I am. Um, I take pretty much, I don't know whether he takes um, a therapist, he has a therapist for depression, but uh, other than that, no, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Regina. That's that's all I had. Okay. Well, Regina, thank you so much. And if there are more questions for Regina, you can forward them to me, and I'll make sure that she gets them, and I we can somehow get you the answer back. Um, Regina, um, any last words? Well, I would just like thank you so much for having me. I I do appreciate it, and um, you know. I hope, I hope um, deep down that you find something to help. If I'm not here, at least other people 
because it's a terrible disease. It really is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Okay. <clears throat> so next up is Dr. Directly from Regina and her experience, and now I'm going to try to give you some a glimpse of what primary mitochondrial diseases are, and um, how we uh, what are we doing in the community in terms of managing them and uh, the hope for the future cure. Um, okay, <clears throat> so everything I'm saying today represents my own professional opinion and has nothing to do with my employer, MGH, any committee or other group that I work with. And I wanted to start by giving you an overview of uh, mitochondrial disease in the general group of inborn errors of metabolism, which is which mitochondrial disorder are part of. So we're not talking about one disease here, we're talking about a large group of disorders. Um, and if you look at this recent uh, classification, international classification of inborn errors of metabolism, mitochondrial disease represent this whole big red area here, which makes up about 23 to 30 percent of all inborn error of metabolism, second only to lysosomal storage disorder. So as a group, they, they are a very large group of uh, disorders. They are genetically inherited and can be caused by either a uh, mutation in the mitochondrial or the nuclear DNA or sometimes both. Mitochondrial disease prevalence has been studied in several countries and rate the minimum point prevalence ranges from one to three per 100,000. And a well accepted prevalence is one in 4,300, including both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA um, defects. So it's not that rare and or as rare as um, other rare, uh, rare disorders, sorry. Okay. Mitochondrial diseases are ubiquitous. Uh, mitochondria are present in every um, organ and every tissue except for red blood cells. So as a result of a dysfunction in the mitochondria, um, you can have any organ and organ system uh, affected. And as you can see here on this list, most organs that are affected are those with the highest energy demand. So you have your central nervous system involvement, your uh, peripheral nervous system, muscle and endocrine system, including diabetes, which can be present in up to 30% of all patients, uh, regardless of the uh, genetic etiology of their disease. Mitochondrial disease can affect both children and adults in any age group and can present with any severity, either as a single uh, symptom or as a syndrome affecting multiple organs and multiple systems. In all the studies that have been done so far and the, in the registries that we have been uh, uh, conducting uh, internationally, exercise intolerance, fatigue, and muscle-related symptom appear to be at the heart of every syndrome, every single mitochondrial disease. And so um, in our North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium uh, funded by the NIH and led by Dr. Michio Hirano, we do see exercise and intolerance and fatigue in up to 45% of all patients uh, uh, all mitochondrial diseases included. Um, in multiple studies that we have done asking the patients what is the most bothersome symptom to them, chronic fatigue and exercise intolerance always rises to the top. And even in studies where we have asked patients if we had a magic pill or a drug that will treat your mitochondrial disease, what symptom would you want to have treated? They always uh, cite the fatigue, the exercise intolerance, and the muscle symptomatology as the top um, uh, issues to be fixed by any drug that we might develop. So that's the reason why um, many of the trials that have been ongoing have focused on fatigue and, and muscle-related symptoms. Um, for the Abliva program, we did do cognitive interviews with patients and uh, exploratory uh, investigation to confirm these findings, which we have done. That paper is uh, submitted and is, um, is uh, under review. So we have found that, again, fatigue rises to the top of the uh, complaints from patient and fatigue does not only affect the physical aspect of a person, but also the emotional aspect where they don't just feel the physical fatigue, but they also feel brain fatigue, 
um, uh, brain, uh, what they call brain fog, lack of motivation, uh, being exhausted physically and emotionally. And that in turn affects multiple, uh, uh, multiple constructs. So fatigue is not just a symptom, it impacts day-to-day -day life, whether physically, emotionally, socially, or even interferes with family dynamics. So it's a a concept that is very important to patient to really fix and that's how and that's why several instruments to measure this fatigue have been developed and have been in the process of being validated um, aside from the multi-systemic um, concerns that a mitochondrial disease brings and the morbid morbidity that that uh, causes in a patient, there is also heightened mortality in patients with primary mitochondrial disease. As evidenced here by this uh, study from the Picard group at Columbia, where they compared uh, 17 cohorts from the literature, they saw that mortality was increased in mitochondrial disease patient, as you see here in the uh, <clears throat> in the less taller curve compared to the national average for men and women with a median age of death at 54 years for patients with mitochondrial disease, all mitochondrial disease encompassing. But even when you break it down by the different um, syndromes, as you see here on the right side, um, this is a study that was led by Dr. Parikh uh, for the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, which is under review right now. You see that uh, all the diseases um, and the syndromes um, that are mitochondrial in nature have an increased mortality. And if you look closer, the ones that have a, an earlier onset, so the pediatric ones, um, which are represented here by Albert syndrome and Pearson and Lee syndrome, they have a much, much higher mortality that is um, that happens in the pediatric age. And the later onset form like CPEO or Sendo or MRF, which Regina had, have a more protracted mortality, but still um, much higher than the national average. And so this is really a devastating disease that not only causes heightened morbidity, but increased and in premature mortality. <clears throat> so for the last 10 years, the community has really mobilized to better understand mitochondrial diseases internationally and in the U.S., um, we have had registries and biorepositories and cohorts that we have studied trying to better understand the impact of the disease and the symptoms, but also in the setting of clinical trial where we had to come up with clinical outcome assessments. And obviously we focused on all the regulatory approved um, outcome measures that are necessary, including biomarkers and patient reported outcome, observer reported outcome, clinician reported and performance outcomes. And for the PROs, we really focused on that fatigue, which always rises to the top of the complaints with multiple um, instruments that have been used, uh, but most lately focused on validating the promise fatigue uh, um, uh, tool, which uh, this, I believe, a trial uh, is using, and also the modified fatigue impact scale. Um, and in terms of performance outcomes, um, which have been regulatory approved um, through multiple discussions with the FDA, um, we have looked at 30 seconds sit to stand, the five times sit to stand, the three time up and go, six minute, 12 minute walk test. All of these have been repeatedly assessed and in, within registries and in prior clinical trials. And uh, the 30 seconds sit to stand seemed to be one of the uh, better performance reported outcome measures to um, to really um, capture that exercise intolerance and the muscle uh, fatigue and weakness that the patient uh, report. Okay, <clears throat> so despite all the efforts and all the um, the the uh, the work that has been done in the mitochondrial field, we still have a lot of unmet needs that we are still working on improving, uh, one of which remains the difficulty to diagnose these patients. Uh, we have had much success with uh, genetic testing, especially since 2010 with the advent of next generation sequencing. We are now up to about 400 um, specific nuclear gene defects that directly impact mitochondrial function and another 1,500 that impact the mitochondria in some way and multiple mitochondrial DNA gene defects as well. And the list continues to rise. And that show 
uh, and that highlights the increased number of patients that we are capturing, diagnosing, and inputting in our registries, including our NAMDEC registry in the U.S., which allow, has allowed us to better understand the disease, better understand the breadth of the spectrum of uh, symptoms that it can uh, affect, and different ways to better understand the genotypes and the biology of the disease. This is true for um, multiple countries, including Europe, which have their own registries and other countries that are now following like Canada, Australia, and Japan. The diagnostic odyssey, which is the time from the symptom onset to the proper di genetic diagnosis of patient continues to be long with an average eight uh, years for patients to be diagnosed in the adult world and one to three years for the pediatric patient. Um, we still lack very specific and sensitive um, uh, ways of diagnosing patient and we still rely on symptoms, family history, and um, we do testing still in blood, urine, and, cent um, and cerebral spinal fluid looking for mitochondrial dysfunction biomarkers. We also look at uh, imaging, including MRI and MR, MR spectroscopy, looking for specific lesions in the brain and that lactate peak that can be very, um, very um, concerning for a primary mitochondrial disease. Um, of course, when we suspect someone of having a mitochondrial disease and knowing that it can affect any organ, we do need to evaluate each organ specifically, including the heart, um, the eye, the, the, the hearing, uh, the kidneys, and the endocrine system very uh, specifically. In the past, we have relied on tissue pathology from muscle biopsies as a tool to diagnose patient. We now know that this can be nonspecific and not um, and, and not very sensitive, as many other conditions can cause uh, a mitochondria to look abnormal under electron microscopy, like here with these very um, enlarged and um, and dense mitochondria. These are the famous ragged red fibers, which are proliferation of mitochondria in the periphery of the muscle fiber, um, all in the Cox positive and SGH negative um, stains that show um, abnormal some abnormalities in the protein within the mitochondria. All of these are corroborating um, findings, but are not diagnostic on their own, as are functional assays like the electromyography, nerve conduction studies, pulmonary function tests, while evaluation looking at the weakness of the muscles in different parts of the body and biochemical testing. We still do these in every patient, um, looking for specific abnormalities, um, but um, if they are positive, they do corroborate the, the, the diagnosis, but alone they cannot be used as a diagnostic tool. In the last five years, we have had high hopes for new biomarkers to be identified. FGF21 and GGF15 have been looked at and seem to be very promising at the time, finding um, uh, of them to be elevated within mitochondrial disease cohorts, uh, but not necessarily as, as high as in other disorders like no other neurological disorders or other neuromuscular disorders. Um, but however, when more people started looking into more specific cohorts, it turns out that their sensitivity and specificity remained not as good as uh, once expected. And maybe a combination of both could be better at improving these sensitivities and specificities, but they are still not being used as a diagnostic tool. They are also impacted by other um, comorbidities such as autoimmunity, diabetes, and heart disease, and so forth and so on. So we still lack some very specific biomarkers. Um, Dr. Mutha's lab at MGH and others have also shown that there could be some uh, specific elevation in different metabolic pathway um, that can showcase mitochondrial dysfunction, such as elevation in the alpha hydroxybutyrate and beta and beta hydroxyisocarnitines and fatty acids. Um, these correlate with disease severity as much as um, lactate levels on the MR spectroscopy and point to a um, NADH reductive stress as a key component of the biochemical pathogenesis of these mitochondrial diseases and the integrated stress response that that induces, which has been mechanistically linked to the high NAD, NADH ratio. Um, this is very interesting given the mechanism of action of KL1333 and the fact that the NAD plus NADH ratio might be the 
the, the catalyst to these abnormalities and that uh, restoring the ratio might bring these down and might reverse the pathology of mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, <clears throat> other diagnostic barriers remain the lack of, um, um, of awareness of the disease, the lack of education within the medical community, um, and the disease complexity. It's not easy to recognize these diseases sometimes, which led us in 2018 to develop the Mitochondrial Care Network, which certifies medical centers of expertise in mitochondrial medicine in an effort to try to bring these patients into uh, specialized centers, shorten the diagnostic odyssey, and provide them with the uh, appropriate management that they deserve. Um, <clears throat> this has been working really well. We have about 21 centers in the U.S. so far, and other countries have followed suit, especially in Europe with their reference network, uh, for European reference network for rare diseases. Um, and this is not uh, um, uncommon for our diseases, for people to rally and develop these centers of excellence. We do still have some obstacles in terms of insurance coverage for diagnostic uh, procedures and, um, and medication coverage and genetic testing coverage, but we are working on improving all of that and uh, getting access to patients. And um, finally, treatment and management we still don't have the cure that all the patients are looking for, but it is still an energy metabolism failure disorder. And so we try to minimize energy losses by avoiding stressors, uh, providing adequate rest, and optimize energy gains by restoring sleep, improving nutrition, providing the, what Regina called the mito cocktail, which is a mixture of supplements and cofactors that will boost ATP production, decrease oxidative stress, and exercise, which we know is the one thing that really improves uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, mitophagy. So in, in, over the long term, improves mitochondrial health and improve, might improve energy and the stamina. <clears throat> And finally, in the last ten years, we have been um, uh, we have been fortunate to have many companies um, interested in in conducting clinical trials, um, and we have seen multiple um, small molecules being trialed. Uh, we have also seen in recent year gene therapy and other new modalities like uh, gene editing and mitochondrial transfer transplant therapy. Um, all of these are um, can be promising. Um, we have to acknowledge knowledge that we have uh, we have encountered some failures in in conducting these trials over the last 10 years but we are persevering and we have learned a lot from these uh, failures so i wouldn't um i would not necessarily see them as a failure to achieve a cure but uh, a learning curve that has allowed us to accumulate a lot of knowledge so that we are now able to better understand how these diseases behave in clinical trials what outcome measures to use and how to better design these clinical trials for best success um, and with that, I am done. I will turn it over to Magnus, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. I'm um, Magnus Hanson. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Abliva. I'm a physician by training, and I've also done academic research. I'm an associate professor at Lund University here in Sweden, where my research has focused on mitochondrial disease mechanisms. So I thought I will go over the K1333 program briefly. I will start with the mechanism of action and look at the results from our phase one program and then more in depth uh, with our uh, ongoing uh, Falcon trial. So, uh, yeah, here uh, is an overview of what we are really targeting in mitochondria to fix the energy problem that you heard Regina described so well and also highlighted by um, Amel. So we were really attracted by our compound k one triple three due to its mechanism of action, which we thought were really a good fit for mitochondrial disease because dysfunctional mitochondria have a disrupted ratio of a molecule called NAD, which exists in two forms, NAD plus and NADH. Uh, and the balance of, of this oxidized form and NAD plus and NADH is really critical for the cell's energy uh, metabolism. So a disrupted redox balance of NAD plus and NADH 
can lead to reductive stress, which really disrupts cellular energy metabolism and contributes to the organ dysfunction and disease deterioration. And as you can see in this image here, the mutation that causes mitochondrial disease impairs the ETC, the electron transport chain, and that causes a reduced conversion of NADH to NAD+, which leads to this abnormal ratio, decreased uh, energy production, but also an inhibition of the natural mitochondrial biogenesis, which leads to build up of new mitochondria to, to compensate for the, uh, for the reduced function of mitochondria. So what are we trying to do with KL1333? Well, KL1333 aims to correct the underlying pathophysiology of mitochondrial disease, specifically by normalizing the NAD plus NADH ratio. KL1333 does that by interacting with an intracellular enzyme called NQO1. It creates a redox cycle where it uses NADH and create NAD plus. So it can compensate for this mitochondrial insufficient generation of NAD+. That in turn restores energy metabolism, both directly, but also indirectly through simulation of mitochondrial biogenesis. That leads to symptom reduction, but also we hope a disease modification by stopping the progression of the disease and improving organ function. There have been very many studies looking at NAD plus and NADH as a target and as a cause for mitochondrial disease. This is one example with quite dramatic effects in a common mitochondrial disease model called the NDUFS4 model, where this component of mitochondria is knocked down. And here we see that mice have very short survival, only 50 to 60 days. But when these researchers, McElroy and colleagues, inserted a NADH oxidase, exactly what we are trying to achieve pharmacologically with K1333, they saw a dramatic improval uh, of survival. And other studies show uh, also how cell metabolism can be rescued and how many of these common biomarkers that have been explored for mitochondrial disease can be normalized. Specifically, specifically for K1333, there's been a number of studies. This highlights a study in uh, cells from a patient with MELAS, with the, the mutation that is most commonly seen in, in adult patients with mitochondrial disease. And in these studies, uh, we, we see that when K1333 restores the abnormal NOT plus NIH ratio, we stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis pathways, which lead in turn to increase mitochondrial mass upregulation of, of the electron transport chain subunits and restored mitochondrial energy production. Moving over to the clinical program, um, as Ellen said, we have had multiple stakeholders contributing to, to our program and into the clinical design. Uh, most importantly, the patient voice. Uh, and we heard Regina speak so well in capturing what we've heard from others how mitochondrial disease really impacts the energy levels and leads to this debilitating fatigue that really impacts quality of life, but also specifically affecting the muscle function. So we decided to focus on these two aspects of mitochondrial disease and discuss that with regulators and got good input and FDA and others have allowed us to study both of these aspects of mitochondrial disease with equal importance. So that has led us to incorporate two specific endpoints for mitochondrial disease, but we can test them uh, uh, independently in our ongoing trial. And as Ella mentioned, of course, it's really important to have uh, the buy-in from, from payers. So we've interviewed the payers. And as you heard, how since these are so important for the quality of life, the payers also really supports these endpoints in the feedback we have received and would be positive to support premium pricing based on that. So if we look more specifically in the, the endpoints uh, we are focused on for fatigue, we have uh, a, a specific scale that we validated for mitochondrial disease, uh, but we've utilized the well-known and validated item bank uh, created by the PROMISE team. And you can see these questions here, and many of these questions tap into what, what Regina told us affected her uh, daily life. 
So this is patient reported outcome, and we believe that this is more sensitive and relevant to the patients uh, uh, with mitochondrial disease than previously more generic scales. Uh, so this has clear benefits. We also wanted to have uh, uh, another leg uh, to stand on. So we looked at a functional objective test, in this case, the 30-second seat to stand test. And this has been supported by the mitochondrial disease expert network as a relevant test of the muscle function uh, in, in mitochondrial disease. And here we ask uh, participants to stand up from a chair as many times as they can during 30 seconds. And we actually had an opportunity to, to test these two types of endpoints in our phase 1B program. So um, we added a cohort of patients uh, already in phase 1, and we tested them with a couple of fatigue scales, but also with this functional endpoint measure, the 30 second seat to stand. To the left hand side, the graph, you can see uh, changes in the fatigue scale. Uh, those patients treated with KL1 triple three are in dark green. You can see that they have a reduction in fatigue symptoms and impacts of fatigue on, on uh, activities of daily living, whereas the placebo controls are in gray. And we were encouraged by this data, not only that there seemed to be an apparent difference between K1, triple three and placebo, but also that the magnitude of difference would be considered clinically meaningful if we compare to data in other disease areas where compounds have been approved. Looking to the right-hand side is then the results from the 30-second sit-to-stand test. And here, an increased capacity to do that test means an improvement in functional leg strength and, and exercise tolerance. Here again, we see a differentiation between those treated with K1 troop 3 and placebo. And again, that difference and that magnitude of change would be considered clinically meaningful when we look at other disease areas. Further to that, uh, we also on exploratory basis looked at um, uh, exposure and the magnitude of effect. And throughout these different clinical uh, outcome measures, we saw that those with the highest exposure in blood also had the greatest magnitude of effect. And you can see that here illustrated in two ways. On the left-hand side are the individual uh, changes uh, compared to the uh, concentration of K1 triple three in blood, where we see a significant correlation between the extent of KL1 triple three in blood and the magnitude of improvement of fatigue levels. And to the right, we've divided uh, uh, it into two groups, those with a higher level of exposure, those with lower uh, and placebo. And we see that there is a gradual uh, uh, trend of improvement based on exposure. We also looked at, at biomarkers uh, of Specific relevance for uh, K1 troop 3 is lactate and lactate pyrite ratio, as that is a, a, a signal of dysfunctional mitochondria and also reductive stress that we target. Uh, to the left hand side, we see uh, that lactate decreases right after we give healthy volunteers K1 troop 3. And to the right hand side, is, uh, it changes uh, in the study in lactate pyrite ratio in patients versus placebo controls. And I'm moving over uh, to the ongoing FALCON study. So this is a phase two study, but with a pivotal study design. And that is really important because that could be sufficient for uh, approval of K1 trip 3 based on this trial as the only placebo controlled trial. And there are three really important aspects into that pivotal study design that we think um, they are key to success of this program. The first is the duration of treatment. You can see that we have 48 weeks of treatment. And that has been seen in other rare disease trials that the magnitude of effect, the differentiation between those actively treated and placebo is really critical to have this duration. Second part is we are really careful in which patient we include in this trial to really optimize the chances of finding uh, a, a true treatment effect of KL1 triple three. And to that extent, we have a long screening period where we not only look at the genetic basis of disease and confirm that, but also make sure that there are uh, uh, good levels of fatigue and myopathy so we can measure an improvement during this study. 
And the last part, which we mentioned, we have this two alternative primary endpoint uh, approach to, to in this study, which means that if either fatigue scale or the 30 second sit to stand test is, uh, is successful, showing statistical significant difference, that will mean that we have a successful study. Right uh, uh, now, we are eagerly awaiting um, for the uh, first 40 patients included in the study to complete their 24 week visit because that data will be taken into an interim analysis. That interim analysis is coming up now mid uh, this year. And that will be important for de-risking the program. Uh, we will get long-term safety for the patients after at least 24 weeks of treatment. And importantly, that will determine the final size of this Falcon study. Um, so we're really looking forward to, uh, to learning those results uh, in, a, in a while. With that, I thought I'd wrap up. And Eleanor, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we do. We have a lot of questions. Um... So this is for uh, Ellen, I think. When do you expect that uh, K1333 will be available? Yeah, great question. I think that's top of everybody's mind after today's discussion. So as Magnus just mentioned, we're having an interim analysis um, mid-year, and that will tell us a lot. It'll tell us a lot about the safety of the drug after 24 weeks of dosing patients, and it'll also tell us the final size of the study. Um, so we actually don't know the answer to that question yet. It could be the study will be anywhere up to 180 patients based on the, the power of those two primary endpoints. So we still have a bit of, of time left before we understand the total size of the study. And as you know, in a rare disease study, um, you know, the difference in patients, it, it can increase our timeline. Um, we also need to mention that there are other things happening in a study um, or in the program in parallel to the study. So we're doing things like non-clinical studies, um, confirmatory evidence packages. We're working on the uh, manufacture of the commercial uh, drug product. And all of those happen in parallel as well. So we need to obviously continue those activities. And I think the amount of financing and the timing of the financing will be important in moving this program along. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also received several questions on uh, when we will study other subgroups of mitochondrial disease, such as nuclear DNA mutations and PDCD, and when the treatment will be available for children with, for example, KSS. Uh, Magnus, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, yes, uh, thanks. I mean, that's a great question. Um, so what we needed to do in this program was really try to focus on a specific group of patients. Um, even though that group is, is fairly large, we still uh, need to be quite selective, really in order to test if, if KO1333 is effective or not. But then of course, after the Falcon study is completed, we would look into, uh, uh, we are required to do a pediatric uh, study program. Uh, so that will come along. Uh, and then, of course, based on the mechanism of action, whatever makes sense, we will, of course, look into evaluate what's the possibility to look at other uh, types of, of mitochondrial disease. Yeah, thank you. And this one is for Amel. Uh, how have diagnostic techniques for mitochondrial disease improved over the past decade? Uh, what are the greatest challenges in diagnosing patients correctly? Yeah, so right now in 2024, a diagnosis is made with the identification of a specific mutation in a gene associated with a mitochondrial disease. So we rely heavily on genetic testing and the improvement have really come with next generation sequencing, allowing us to do large panels with of nuclear DNA um, assessments and full mitochondrial DNA sequencing. Um, in the last three years, we've had access to whole genome sequencing um, on top of the whole exome sequencing that we um, have had access to since about 2013. And so the only limitation at this point is insurance coverage. Some insurance companies still refuse to pay for these large scale uh, whole genome um, assessments. And so we still have to fight for them and, um, and, and, and get uh, some patients are not able to get them through their insurance. And so um, several advocacy groups have been offering free of charge genetic testing 
which is also a great opportunity for patients to get to that diagnosis. Mm. Thank you. Uh, so, and this one is for Magnus. Uh, we realized that the interim readout for K1333 in Falcon is unlikely to be fileable, uh, but what efficacy signals, if shown, could per permit Ableva to file for accelerated approval given PMD is such a serious disease? That's an important question uh, uh, because we will not test uh, if efficacy formally, so it will only be the conditional power. So that is actually uh, out of the question. Uh, so we will save that power for uh, testing uh, uh, when the study is completed. Okay, yeah. Um, and the next one is for you as well, Magnus. Um, what competitive edge do you believe KL1333 has over therapies in development? And others are mentioning Reneo and Astellas here as well. Yeah, I believe the, the most important part is um, the, the mechanism of action. Um, that's why I was initially very intrigued by KL1333 as a compound. Um, but then, of course, we've, we've learned from, uh, from the trials that have been ongoing and you mentioned Reneo, they've been very generous sharing their experience. So I think we gradually built better and better trials to be able to evaluate uh, a therapy, potential new therapy in mitochondrial disease. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one other question is, why are you doing an interim analysis? And can you give us some more details uh, of what will be analyzed, Magnus? You want to speak to that? No, no. I mean, well, there are several reasons. Um, one one reason is uh, that I mean, these endpoints, even though we've shown that they are relevant uh, uh, for mitochondrial disease, they haven't been tested in our specific population. So we actually don't have the natural history data to do really detailed um, power calculations or determine what size of study do we need. That's why we're using the actual trial data now uh, to do with our proper um, powering of the study to make sure that, that we have um, the, the patients needed to show uh, efficacy. And then, of course, we, we move from a short duration phase one trial to a long duration now. So it's also really important to, to make sure that the safety profile is, is still there. So the, the risk benefit ratio. And then lastly, we're also conscious of, of resources and the use of patients. So we thought it would make sense to, to first recruit a smaller um, um, a number of patients and then expand the, the study as appropriate. Okay. So I think time is running out, but do we have time for one more? One more, one last question. Uh, what, so what gives us the confidence that KL1333 will be positioned for? for success? Really interesting question. I think I think that we believe in this drug um, for a number of different reasons. I think as we've mentioned multiple times, it really, the mechanism of action is well aligned with the core deficit in this, in this patient population, that being the NAD plus NADH ratio and the modulation of those two coenzymes. So, I mean, going to the core of the disease is really important. And um, I think that that, that will be a very exciting. We also have a great safety profile for this, this program. I think we've dosed over 100 patients and healthy volunteers in the previous studies, and now we have a whole group coming on board as well. And in those previous studies, we saw no SAEs, serious adverse events associated with the drug. And so the profile of the drug looks very good. We also have a study, done a study on the interaction of our drug with other drugs, and that also looks very good. So we're excited about the safety profile. As you know, drugs often fall out of development because of that. Um, and so that we like our early signs of efficacy. You saw the phase 1B data, um, and it really, although it was a small patient cohort, it really spoke to us because it had we had good clinically meaningful evidence over the three clinical endpoints we looked at. All three of them hit. Um, we had an, an um, exposure effect relationship and we had target engagement. And those two things are important because they show that it's probably the drug that's doing this, probably not just chance. Um, so we're excited about that. I think we also have a good design. Uh, we've worked very closely with 
um, scientific advisors, clinical advisors, regulators, payers to try to come up with a design that we thought would be successful. And I think what we've done is pretty unique here, very different from some of our competitors. And we're excited to see that that prove out. And I think, you know, I think in closing, what makes me the most excited is the collaboration that we've had with the community in this. A number of them are on the call today. Um, and we just feel really privileged to be able to work with such smart people. Um, you can't do this alone. Rare diseases, it's very difficult. Um, we want to make sure we do the right study so we test the drug appropriately. Um, and so the collaboration that we've had with the patients, the physicians, the clinicians, the patient advocacy groups, the community, and our competitors, I think is phenomenal. Um, you don't often see an area where you are regularly talking to competitors and helping each other because um, we are all out here for the same reason as to develop the drug for these patients. Um, and we're hoping that this KL1333 might be the first one. So thank you all for coming today. We appreciate your time. It's been great. Um, let us know if you have questions. You can email us. Um, our email address is on Thank you.